and uh, I don't know what's quite happening. That was strange. Um, apologies for that. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what was happening with, with that. We had some, some feedback. Apologies. But anyway, welcome back. <laughs> welcome back, everybody, to uh, to this session eight of uh, of this year's this year's conference. Um, so I hope everyone had the chance to uh, to maybe check out some of the uh, showcase sessions uh, that we had during the quick break that we've had there, and there was more of a, more of an opportunity to to also do that later on. Um, so we're moving on in the uh, next session to be looking at uh, what we're saying is new spectrum bands, new technologies and new approaches. And we have a panel discussion coming up looking at those issues shortly. Before we do that, though, we do have what we're calling a thinking point uh, to, to focus specifically on one area of that. And to tell you more about that and to introduce all of our speakers and our panelists and to, to moderate the session, I'd like to now welcome to the stage uh, Mark Eschenberg from Ether. Mark, welcome. Great to have you with us again. Great. And uh, yeah, Great. looking forward to it. As I said, we've got the thinking point first of all and onto the main panel. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you to explain more. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Dan. And uh, good good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's a pleasure to be at the European 5G Spectrum Conference. Uh, my name is Mark Eschenberg. I work for Ether Consulting. We're a specialist telecoms consultancy. And so kind of very tuned into the whole topic and of course, following it with extreme interest. Today's session eight is all about the kind of understanding the future better. And you know, to understand the future, you need, you need to understand the networks, the demand, and also of course the services that will be offered over those future networks. And to start off the session, we have um, Guillaume Lebrun from Meta here, who will, um, who will himself introduce another colleague who's um, pre-recorded a session as a result of being in a, in a very different time zone. So Guillaume, um, it's great to have, have Meta on board here to understand more about your your view of the future and the service you look to offer so uh, i'll hand over the floor to you thanks mark and hi everyone uh, yeah apologies that you see me i know that you all came in for bruno and not for me uh bruno was really excited to be here today um uh, just because of all the uh, the connection between 5g and the metaverse and the all the opportunities that these two topics bring when they uh, discuss together um, and unfortunately some last minute events uh, prevented him from being here However, um, he recorded his, his uh, presentation, so I hope that you still get uh, most of the content. And of course, if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask them, and I'll be uh, I'll do my best to try to respond to them at the end. But without f much further ado, um, let's have a look at what uh, Bruno can share with you about the metaverse and 5G. <music> Hello, everyone. My name is Bruno Sendo Martin, and I'm the Senior Director of Wireless Technologies at Meta Reality Labs. It is an immense pleasure for me to be today at this EU 5G Spectrum Conference, and I will be talking to you about wireless technologies and the metaverse. There's a lot to do. But first of all, before talking about our products and our technologies, let me tell you a story to start. You know, in 1943, Abraham Maslow, a psychologist, built a pyramid that comprised a five-tier model of human needs. Connection is nested with love, which is critical to our survival. Friends, family, art, culture, these are all the product of our drive to find and cherish and celebrate the connections we have with one another. We search to the edge of the earth to find love and to the edge of the universe to find life. And when you find it, you try not to let it go. In Meta Reality Labs, we see connections made across three walks, physical, augmented, and virtual. Physical world, you and I here today, face-to-face -face meetings, video calling. Augmented world is adding layers to what you see in the physical world in order to augment the world you live and the world you are with both expression and utility. And virtual world is the place where you put yourself in a virtual experience that transcends time and space. Right now, transitioning between worlds, it's quite cumbersome. Physical to augmented, you need to use your phone. You need to have multiple tabs to get to the app and have your experience. In the case of the virtual reality, well, you need to get your headset 
in order to get to that experience. Headsets that still have a lot to grow and a lot to improve. For those of you who have kids, you will see, they're gonna be moving fluidly between worlds. Imagine inviting your uncle who lives in London to sit around you for a dinner table in New York. These and things like these are the true promises or augmented reality. What would it take to feel transponded to another place? The tools we are building at Meta across VR and AR have the opportunity to answer this. We see it in video presence with our portal products, where there is an opportunity to create a platform that enhance presence in the home and in the work. And we also see it in virtual reality with our VR headsets, where we can be transponded to the metaverse and experiment a fully immersive remote presence experience. Let me tell you about our video presence device, Portal. Portal create that sense of presence. Its unique camera and audio features makes you feel in the same room as the person you are talking with. It gives you the ability to share music, stories, and much more. Fully packed with artificial intelligence, you connect more often and better with the right people at the right time. And it is inclusive, and this allows you to call friends even if they don't have a portal, because it's compatible with a lot of applications. And it allows you to use it for work, making your remote presence better than ever. It's been my personal companion day to day while I've been working from home for the last two years because of COVID. Our current generation of portal has four products on the market, providing an unprecedented video calling experience. If you haven't tried a portal yet, do yourself a favor and check it out. Portal provides a high quality wireless interface and our wireless teams are working together with the product teams to keep improving the experience in the future by providing better bandwidth, lower latencies, and improve even more the remote presence feeling by giving highest quality video and many other features. We recently launched Raven Studies in partnership with Luxonica. Raven Stories is our first wearable product that allows the user to create video and photo content with unique point of view and enjoy audio listening and calls directly from the glasses. All of it respecting one of the most iconic designs in the industry. This is a product that has a great engineering work behind, delivering on features with a very challenging technology integration. Believe me, getting all the radio antennas with highest performance without affecting that iconic ID, that was challenging. Then we have our current generation of VR. Oculus Quest 2 is the best and most complete standalone VR experience in the market, a number one. In the future, we are going to make some big leaps in both tech and content for the next generations of these products. We are going to build each of these as platforms. So what you build will work across multiple generations of each device. And yes, VR, we are still early. This is what needs to happen for in VR to succeed and to get to the future we all want. The next few years are gonna be exciting for the future of VR and VR. And I'm looking forward to see the progress that we are gonna make together. You only have to see how we were two or three years ago and what we needed to have a full VR experience. You needed a $2,000 computer with a headset, at least two camera sensors, and two controllers to have your whole immersive experience. Right now, this is VR, a headset, self-contained, with embedded hand detection and totally wireless. And it's getting better and better. The industry now understands that VR is not only about gaming. It's way more than that. Think about having virtual meetings with your colleagues, working on a product design across the world, practice new ways of telemedicine beyond video call, have remote presence with your loved ones, talk about architecture without being there, or even, I don't know, see before anyone the next one fashion. Everything is going to be possible with VR.
And we are definitely working to converge all our experiences in the metaverse. The metaverse will be the next generation of the internet, a place that will enable creators to deliver fully connect and immersive experiences and a new source of revenue for your networks. 5G has a significant role to play as it will enable countless new use cases and scenarios on the metaverse. We are already bringing the initial experience for the metaverse with our Horizon products. In this video, you can see Horizon Workrooms, a fully immersive experience for collaborative work with all the necessary productivity tools. You have a whiteboard, you can see your keyboard, you can do screen sharing from your computer, you can even have people connecting with regular video call, a full productivity experience. This is just the first step of many that we're gonna have in the following years. The metaverse is gonna evolve beyond the archive. Remember, as we have already shared, we are building AR glasses. And the challenges on wireless and connectivity on this are very impressive. To make the meta dream reality and to make the augmented a virtual reality world dream a reality, this is something for the whole industry. We firmly believe that better connectivity is key to build connections across the physical world augmented reality and virtual reality. AR and VR devices need to operate at speeds that are acceptable for the human brain. Single digit and low double digit millisecond values are required to avoid uncomfortable experiences, to enable realism and long usage without side effects. And as we go to the cloud or split computer architectures, this becomes an end-to-end -end challenge to be solved at device, network, and infrastructure level. This is something that 5G starts dealing with the upcoming release 17 on 3GPP, but this needs to be one of the main focus on the upcoming release 18. And this is something we are very actively working and we want to work with all the ecosystem in the industry. Best connectivity will be enabled by both 5G and Wi-Fi. As we said before, we need to use the benefits of both technologies. 5G needs to go beyond on end-to-end -end KPI for XR, that is augmented reality and virtual reality. We need to improve on latency, on jitter, on bandwidth, and especially on, we need to provide a lower device complexity. We won't be doing mobile phones, we will be doing something else. In the case of Wi-Fi, we will need to enable different things. It will be very important to have very low power profiles for our devices, so we can enable an ecosystem of interconnected devices, bringing new superpowers to the user. It will be also very important to enable as many high bandwidth channels, 160, 320 megahertz channels for our de devices in the future. The needs on the Wi-Fi are going to be pretty unique and completely different of what we know right now. The world is already embracing 6 gigahertz for Wi-Fi. Many countries and regions are already moving ahead with the adoption of 6 gigahertz. Silicon vendors have already platforms that are over there to be integrated in products. And you have products out there in the market providing this capability and this usage of the spectrum. And it's great to see how more and more regions and countries are getting on the board of using this spectrum for Wi-Fi. It will be great to harmonize. It's a very important message to understand that five megahertz on the six gigahertz spectrum is gonna enable a first wave of products uh, in some regions, but the wall needs to go to 1200 megahertz. The market and the users will largely benefit from freeing up as many high bandwidth channels as possible. And 5G is also key for the success of AR VR. 5G new capabilities are gonna be needed to address latency, jitter, 
and bandwidth limitations that, that legacy cellular network present. It's going to be very important to enable this and improve this in the future. This is going to generate value and new revenue streams for 5G. Networks, standards, and spectrum also need to evolve to improve the adoption of AR, VR, and in general, the wearable space. The capabilities of 5G RedCap are going to need to evolve in release 18 as we are going more into a wearable world. So we need less complexity, but better features. Coexistence with Wi-Fi is key for the success of 5G. We want to have a continuity in the user experience. We want to have the probability of seamlessly interconnecting the devices with very high bandwidth, but also a very small duty cycle to be in order to save power. And we want to guarantee the best indoor communications. So thank you very much for listening to me today. It's been a pleasure. And as we say in Meta, this journey is only 1% finished. This is still too much to discover, to develop, to learn and to explore with this technology, especially on the AR, VR and wearable space. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, well, Guillaume in this case, um, but thank you to Bruno as well for a very, very, very insightful presentation. Um, I think it, it gave a good idea of the sort of the first ideas on the on the services that are likely to be used um, in the future. But of course, it, it still raises, of course, um, it shows that there is much more that could be that could come. Um, and just to maybe tie it into some comments and questions from the audience, one thought that went through my mind when seeing the presentation. Um, actually, two kind of related thoughts, which is kind of what are the networks that are needed to to um, to enable the metaverse? Bruno already kind of hinted at some of the points, and the the comments questions from the audience here were um, first of all the question of with all the cost and energy requirements for 5G, um, there was a statement that the metaverse may not extend very far without satellite, um, and I guess linked to that as well the question of is this mostly an indoor? Um, discussion first, or kind of can we go outdoor with the metaverse, and who would then use the metaverse outdoors, and what's needed for that? It's all the question in one go. Um, yeah, um, it's it's so you can definitely think of the first use case, especially when you talk about virtual reality as being incredibly important indoor. I mean, and that's where you see things like education, some of the health application, uh, but I really would not limit it to to indoor. Um, if you think about AR, and that's Bruno's point that we're also developing AR glasses, uh, augmented reality is something that's really going to happen also on the go. Um, it could be a help to a driver of a car and to that the animals are you know, highlighted or a kid that's about to cross the street highlighted. Um, it could be just when you're in the street, like having the name of a building put on top of it so that uh, you know where you're going. So, um, I mean, 5G is going to have an important role to play, especially about all the use case of the metaverse or the augmented reality of the mixed reality that will be on the go. So I wouldn't oppose the two notion. Um, the main thing that we see is that we will need um, an increase in the connectivity capabilities. And whichever networks manage to do that, we're going to need them. We already know we need Wi-Fi. That's clear. Um, and, and we need as many channels as we can. Uh, because that's how we connect the headsets with um, some of the devices that will compute um, the kind of uh, virtual world. That's how the headset can be light and not use too much battery. So we know we need Wi-Fi, but then what's the technology after that to go to the internet? Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, fiber is going to play a role, satellite can play a role in, in a rural area, 5G is going to play a role, in, especially in mobility. Um, so, so we're not we we network agnostic. We just know that two things: we need more investment in connectivity, and the service can bring additional revenue. So that's where we see a good potential for collaboration, because that can really trigger more demand for connectivity services and 5G services. Yes, I think that that that's I think a very good starting point. It kind of shows that there's kind of kind of growing from the inside out, so to say, get it, get it to work, kind of, you know, you, you get it to work indoors, but also you try at the same time, um, probably get some, probably in the, in the beginning, less demanding use cases in, in the, on the kind of when you go outdoors and then kind of then as the networks mature, 
kind of move more of, of the things you can maybe experience in a, in a in a fixed environment towards a more mobile environment. Yeah, and the point is that we want to really create a, an enabling platform. But I mean, content creator are the people that are really going to bring new services. What we see is that you have lots of new services, lots of exciting services, things that people are ready to pay for um, that are being developed. And so we should really try to bring the devices and bring the community up to up to the level that they demand so that we can um, just get these benefits and, and get this additional revenue. Yeah, perfect. I think that, uh, that, that, that to me, that was, a, that was a very good start to the, to the session. Thanks very much to you, Omen, of course. Please extend, please extend my thanks to, to, to Bruno for this, for this great start um, to, this, to this session. Okay, and, and following this first thinking point on the metaverse, we're moving straight into the, the, the main panel discussion in this session. Um, the topic stays very much on the, on the question of, of the evolving connecting landscape. Um, and as I already kind of hinted in the beginning of the session, it's, we're trying to understand, kind of take a look at the future and try to understand what is what is like to come in the next few years and what needs to be put in place for services to be able to evolve what are the spectrum requirements or the infrastructure requirements and also again what is the what is the service perspective to answer that question we have a we have a quite a varied panel um, and we will try to address this top kind of this topic in a very systematic way um, we will start with more of a regulatory perspective i'm very pleased to have two people um two very distinguished people from the european from the European regulatory landscape. First, we have Brandy Mestanchuk, who is the head of sector for Spectrum for Wireless Broadband at the EC. And we have Alexander Kuhn, who is the head of Spectrum um, at Benetza. Um, both of them will, will give their view on the topic. Um, it will then be followed by, uh, by an industry, by some industry perspectives. We first have Simon Watts, who is the chair of the Standards Working Group at GSOA. Um, we have Ayman Muyadin, who is the, um, the chair of the 6G Spectrum team at GSA. And last but certainly not least, we have Lauren Inhut, who is a government affairs director at Microsoft. So good morning to all of you, or good afternoon to all of you. It's great to have you on the panel. I look forward to, a, to an interesting discussion. And we will start with Vladimir to, um, to set the scene from the European Commission's perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, glad to be part of this uh, year's conference on, on 5G developments uh, in the European context. Uh, I would like to present the EU-level uh, perspective on the uh, essential aspects of spectrum policy for the next years, uh, much in the context of uh, our uh, recently announced uh, digital decade uh, strategy. Uh, next slide, please. I have prepared uh, one slide uh, which summarizes my introductory points. Uh, I'll start with the uh, obvious uh, fact that uh, spectrum policy is traditionally linked to uh, cutting edge technology development and innovation, and it, uh, this makes also our work so exciting. Uh, as highlighted in previous sessions uh, already, we are witnessing uh, rapid and disruptive uh, technology changes, uh, which enable a growing variety of wireless services and applications with a direct relation, a relation to spectrum demand and spectrum usage. Uh, I could mention, uh, of course, the continuous development of uh, uh, towards the next generation technology. And uh, this is uh, obviously uh, um, the case uh, with the move from 5G to 6G, but also uh, for other uh, platforms, the move to Wi-Fi 7 uh, in the Wi-Fi domain the move to high throughput satellites or constellations of small connected satellites, uh, also to mention 5G broadcast as an enabler uh, possibly for next generation terrestrial broadcasting. Uh, with 6G, uh, there are different, uh, let's say, uh, developments like extreme connectivity, network sensing, uh, which generate uh, also huge expectations in terms of spectrum management. Also cloud native and edge architectures, uh, which support uh, network virtualization and low latency services um, have uh, their role to play. And of course, artificial intelligence for predictive uh, reconfiguration of uh, the network and also for predictive spectrum management and sharing. Furthermore, we see a steady trend towards uh, hybrid and convergent uh, communication systems, uh, such as uh, terrestrial satellite. Uh, 
We have, uh, of course, uh, the joint sensing and communication systems on the rise with 6G, uh, the, also the cyber physical systems enabling the tactile internet with fundamental implications for human machine communications. On that basis, new applications have emerged with 5G and uh, as already mentioned in the conference, they're expected to reach possibly maturity only with 6G. Uh, they rely on high quality wireless connectivity. Often these are industrial mission critical applications like automated transport, like drones, uh, like uh, cobots, the automated cooperative robots of the future. Further examples are obviously extended reality, which Bruno already mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, holographic telepresence or uh, the applications under the category of the Internet of Senses. All these uh, developments, uh, and uh, uh, which are so exciting, confront a spectrum policy and regulation with the need for uh, swift adaptation and a change of mindset. I would refer to several main challenges from our EU level perspective. Uh, the first is obviously the growing variety of spectrum users, uh, much more verticals and also spectrum practices. This calls for a continued spectrum roadmap at the EU level uh, to identify spectrum ranges and their usage. The second is uh, given the growing spectrum scarcity and the dynamic requirements of new applications shared use but also more flexible agile spectrum uh, access possibly based on artificial intelligence uh, in its management should become uh, mainstream should become the norm and ensure a balanced approach to meeting spectrum needs new bands are being considered for 6g uh, in particular the terahertz frequencies including optical the optical range where regulators have to carefully assess the needs and timing of their availability. This is linked to ensuring the usual spectrum mix we need with, I think, every generation of uh, mobile and other technology and a migration path from older to newer generations. I think the take up of harmonized millimeter wave bands for 5G will be an important benchmark when evaluating spectrum demand in this regard. Furthermore, I would uh, uh, also highlight that, uh, of course, spectrum policy is embedded in a wider policy context. I could mention here sustainability, <clears throat> the green policy, uh, autonomy, uh, the, the social cohesion, for example, linked to the bridging of the digital divide, and of course, public safety, uh, for example, studying the, uh, and updating the uh, EMF uh, let's say conclusions, the, the role of EMF on public health, and of course, uh, ensuring uh, the protection of the public from uh, any harmful effects of radiation. And above all, uh, I think uh, EU harmonization and coordination of spectrum authorization rules uh, should play a more prominent role in the future. This is on the one hand to foster a new ecosystem of uh, uh, devices of components, but also to prevent uh, the uh, cost which fragmentation could incur on investment and deployment. For example, with uh, diverging spectrum management practices of member states uh, which uh, address uh, one and the same issue. It is furthermore also essential to uh, foster uh, EU unity in shaping international negotiations on additional spectrum needs. And I'm referring here obviously also to uh, the terahertz range and to the developments uh, within uh, the uh, World Radio Communication Conference. And we need, of course, uh, an, an, a more consolidated approach to international standardization. With this, I would uh, stop here and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Branimir, for this for this first look from a from a from a European perspective. I think you introduced some very interesting um, thoughts, and I think in particular aspects like whether there, where there is spectrum scarcity, take, looking at the take up of, of millimeter wave are important considerations to take into account, which we may pick up later in the discussion. So thanks very much for your for your first for your first contribution. The next the next speaker in our panel is Alexander Kuhn, who is the head of spectrum at the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany. Alexander, good good afternoon and uh, good afternoon, Mark. Thank you very much uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure, and uh, we are living in exciting times today. 
And it's uh, nice to be here back to the 5G conference, even in a virtual environment. I think we see that virtual reality is already taking place in our all uh, day to day's lives. So therefore, I, let me make some introductory remarks to this forward looking approach of this 5G conference and beyond. So next slide, please. Uh, if you if you look to um, the main question, which was going to this section, is what drives me a little bit, is uh, the question, will the next generation of mobile networks really deliver what 5G was already supposed to do? So we, we discussed a lot of things there that is uh, coming to with the structure of the network itself, which is the encompassing of edge computing, which then allows also to make our cities more smarter, make our day-to-day -day life more smarter, which may allow also, and running a touch uh, base on this particular particular points as well, autonomous driving. And in particular, 5G already opened up the complete new world of an idea which uh, uh, is always on the mind, which we are when we are discussing next generation networks, it's the network of networks. Um, I think the, um, the presentation from Meta was already showing to us that we will have a lot of new networks which are more private ones and uh, maybe personal ones, which may be linked then later on in this Metaverse with public networks, with other uh, types of networks. And therefore, we need to deal with the situation from a regulatory perspective, how to um, take the right consequences and encourage everybody to work in that direction, but also answer the main questions regarding particular uh, points uh, on this uh, network of networks regarding the security, the safetyness, the quality of service. So how can we all these new possibilities when we are building up mesh networks of different radio communication services into a whole new environment in a whole new structure? That will create a lot of questions for us in the future. And uh, I'm happy that the spectrum management is always forward looking and trying to address the right questions at the right point in time. We are now more or less, yeah, I would say, 10 years, maybe a little bit less from the first 6G um, networks away but we need to discuss then also what how do we deliver then the spectrum to the market how can we make it available what kind of spectrum do we like to use and running me a touch on that one there that we will use every single spectrum and every single heads which is already available but we are looking also to the new frontiers of spectrum and that will be the terahertz front we would like to experience here of course new um, data rates Everybody is expecting that one. New data rates are always going along with new bandwidth, broader ones, and, and therefore new spectrum in a higher frequency range is something which is definitely uh, in essential part. On the other side, well, we heard it as well in the presentation that uh, the augmented and virtual realities may require also new technology um, capacities and um, air latencies in particular. Um, to work uh, in a real-time environment and provide the right um, service to the customer. And therefore, we need to ha make use of artificial intelligence in a much broader scope. Does this allow us to move forward also in spectrum management with regards to the licenses? How could they be more flexible? How could we ensure the quality of service, even if those licenses are more flexible? Up to now, we have the maybe separated worlds, I would say, with Wi-Fi, with the public networks, uh, with 5G, but also with satellite networks and IoT networks. So we, are, we have a very, I would say, boxed system already, which allows then a good quality of service of those different categories of radio services. But with regards to the 6G environment, and already 5G may allow this to a certain degree, this creates the question, do we have to keep this box system or do we have to think ahead of that one? Um, also the question of maybe uh, censoring networks via mobile networks or censoring uh, applications moving into the direction. Do we have to think about a different categorization already at a global scale? And uh, do we have to think about in that way that we have to redistinguish what kind of radio services are we needing? That uh, is the question to media services. That is the question to data services. Is everything now a data service? And how could we enhance and maybe facilitate then the idea of the network of networks? So there are a lot of consequences ahead, which needs to be um, purely evaluated. And the BNET server is working in that direction already now in order to digest clearly what is necessary for the market, set the right incentives, but also allowing them the right protection of the consumer and all the other market players to provide and uh, facilitate further in uh, innovation uh, up to 2030 and beyond. 
Next slide, please. One big part from our side is then, of course, the research. We have, uh, regarding the terahertz frequencies, already very successful test setups in Berlin. We have uh, stable connections already over 100 meters between the um, hein Heinrich Herz Institute and the university in Berlin. And those frequency bands which have been used there is right in the lower terahertz frequencies between 155 and 175 gigahertz. We have already a lot of research already starting back uh, to 2012 by our university in Braunschweig with terahertz research beyond 275 gigahertz. So you see, Germany is already prepared and moving into the new world of terahertz frequencies, indoors and maybe also outdoor connectivity, but of course with very limited coverage areas, but with a very high possibility of new bandwidth there. On the European side, we see, of course, and we are taking part in the HEXA-X, uh, development and also in the horizon Europe. We need here definitely some more innovation and we need definitely the right technology answers to the questions, which is then accompanied with the right regulatory regime, which needs to be more, move forward. And uh, now to the last side, please. The main part from our side is that we have a global challenge. Europe could form here an integral cluster uh, for this new world together with other areas as well. And But we need to find and uh, define uh, a new global world which allows and facilitates everything uh, in a vision for 2030 and beyond. And the ITU is already working in that direction. I have already put here some of the elements here and you see also a workshop from the ITU planned for June 22. Um, which can also bring some answers in that direction. But in any case, we need to have then a global debate. How could we change the environment and adapt it to the 2030s and beyond? And I think with this message, I'll leave it to the further consideration and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Alexander. I think it was a very interesting presentation. I think you clearly highlighted the need to kind of try and stay ahead of the curve to make sure you put the right the right regulatory system in place to, to deal with future market demands. I also think you you nicely illustrated in, in, in a few comments that that universal, I think, challenge you will have in those new networks between the throughput achieved and the coverage achieved, which is kind of a, an obvious trade-off. The higher you go, the, the worse the coverage. And I think those are those are important questions in answering. Probably also have questions on kind of follow-on impacts on network infrastructures, on, on, on market, on market shape. So it's a it's a fascinating uh, fascinating topic and, and thank you very much for your contribution to it. My pleasure. The next, the next speaker in our panel is, is Simon Watts. Um, Simon is the chair of the Standards Working Group at GSOA and I think Simon you wanted to start by telling us more about GSOA, a, an acronym that surprised me when we, <laughs> uh, when we talked um, before this, before the session. Yeah, good morning Mark, good morning, good afternoon everyone. Um, yes, so I'm representing the Global Satellite Operators Association, which um, my colleague Artie introduced um, yesterday, is the evolution on from um, the ISOA, which is the European Middle East and Africa Operators Association. Um, yeah, I'm proud to um, support all, all those efforts. Uh, as the chair of the Standards Working Group, I work for Avanti, a, who are a satellite operator and an active member of Nauru ISOA. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I want to, to talk about how satellites play a role in the wider community. And traditionally, possibly, there's been the many people have had a perception that satellites are used for communications in isolation. The reality, of course, was not that that was not the case. Um, we've been an integral part of the global communications ecosystem for as long as I've worked, which is over 40 years in the industry. Um, Large networks have been implemented with a mix of satellite and terrestrial nodes, satellite connections link to major communications hubs. It's provided connectivity for end users that maybe connect via Wi-Fi or cellular connections, pre-5G. Um, we've used um, satellite-specific frequency bands, LNS band for handsets and small devices, C band, KU, and KA band for many different applications. So. Um, that, that's the, the past. So next slide, please. And more recently, in common with uh, the whole telecommunications sector, satellites um, ha have been involved in working ever more closely with terrestrial um, players. Uh, it, this changing landscape is illustrated 
through um, geo satellite. These are these are station the traditional stationary orbiting satellites. Um, there many different variations there from the very large, very high throughput, terabit per second through the through the spacecraft, to small and more highly flexible systems. And MEO have come along in the last few years to provide a lower latency, very high throughput service. LEO constellations, the low, low Earth orbit um, satellites that so often seem to make the new, news. These are these have been widely available for many years and the mega, mega constellations are um, throwing up hundreds and thousands of satellites to, um, a, a, as we speak pretty much. There are newer standards compliant LEO systems that are being considered and I'll come back to that uh, a bit later. Um, all these systems have served broadband backhaul, um, Internet of Things and many other use cases. Um, different satellites, um, different constellations, different operators serve different markets and have different strengths, but they're all complementary to terrestrial. The sort of developments you see in the terrestrial world are also um, having a major impact in, in the satellite telecommunications world, flat panel antennas, software defined radios, virtualization of everything, um, using and adapting technologies from the terrestrial universe are, are helping significantly. And uh, 5G ecosystem developments in backhaul direct to the user equipment are being pursued. Um, I'll talk a bit about standards later. The, however, in summary, um, the integration of non-terrestrial networks fully into uh, 5G is ongoing work at 3GPP. Uh, in terms of frequency bands, KA band is, is wi widely used, QV band high frequency um, band is, is, is in increasingly being used. Significant increases in frequency reuse with some of the new satellites to um, better use that and make better use of the spectrum, offer ever greater speeds to the end user. The LNS bands and KU bands remain important. Um, as we've seen earlier, C band is now being used in for 5G in some countries, the um, three, four gigahertz uh, band. Uh, next slide, please. So satellite in the net network uh, networks of tomorrow. Um, this slide has been shown by my colleagues, but the, it, from a, a networking standpoint, you can have multiple satellites in multiple com constellations with multiple operators in multiple orbits, multiple frequency bands, some shared, some dedicated, m mass massive levels of frequency use, reuse, working in integrating with satellite, with terrestrial networks in, in many different ways and many different use cases. Um, to provide an include to provide inclusive five and later five G advanced and six G services to um, everyone, everywhere, anywhere, anytime. So that's without satellite, you that vision and dream of, of, of inclusivity cannot be met. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So some of the relevant developments from the standards area. Um, Release 17, which uh, uh, middle, uh, end of end of this first quarter, specifications for 5G new radio over non-terrestrial network and narrowband I over T over non-terrestrial network have been worked on in in the RAN group. Um, three technical standards within the system architecture arena uh, um, have had have been updated in support of SATCOM. And moving forward into release 18. Um, <clears throat> The um, RAN cleanery in, at the end of last year look, uh, foresees enhancements for further enhancements for um, new radio over non-terrestrial networks. Not, NTN is, is the acronym used by many to refer to future developments of satellite uh, and also HAPS it, it supporting 5G terrestrial. Um, there are also includes providing um, VSAT services ESIM in this context means Earth Station in Motion. So this means providing an antenna on a vehicle, on a plane, or, or whatever, um, to to act to relay the services to people to the passengers and and, and, and operators of these vehicles. Um, the harmonised KA band will be used as the reference for all these studies. 
um, and it's all part of being a good citizen and, and, and working together. Um, this is this radio access network analysis is being complemented by the system architecture um, working study groups, um, looking at further work on how, how best to provide uh, satellite backhaul for 5G and later uh, and beyond, um, and also how to best in incorporate non-terrestrial networks within within this. I, I, we chose to include these 5G um, developments in 3GPP, but it has to be complemented by other standards um, for us, such as, um, for example, IETF, uh, TM Forum, Etsy, IEEE, and so on, to do this work. So last slide. In conclusion, um, satellites are changing um, and evolving along with the terrestrial network, supporting the ongoing and, and further integration and convergence to support 5G services uh, um, where fiber and others either can't reach or can't be completely relied on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. It's always always important to kind of be reminded of the of the important role the satellite plays, and also, of course, the kind of the complementary nature it could play in if we talk about universality of services. Um, so, thanks very much for that contribution, um, and of course, I look forward to discussing it further in the panel in a, in a, in a few moments. Next speaker is Ayman Moyaldin. She's the um, chair of the 6G Spectrum team at GSA. So, Ayman, very much look forward to having you in the panel and to your contribution now. Uh, good day to everybody and thanks uh, for uh, Forum Global uh, to give us the opportunity to speak on behalf of GSA here on, on, this, um, on this topic of the landscape of uh, the new generations and the new connectivity style that we're going to have. Um, I have put a picture uh, here for some of the publication from a GSA side, you can take a look at them so that you can uh, see the reports that we are developing material. And uh, you can see that we have, uh, this is our recent uh, publication from a GSA. And you can see also some reports that touch upon the, uh, the several uh, pillars of the technologies and uh, 6G is one of them or the future uh, wireless connectivity is, this is what we see. Next slide, please. So that the spirit of uh, innovation and pushing the technology to the boundaries, uh, this is resulted in with what we today uh, is taken as a granted for our communication. We, we, we are sitting here almost two years uh, with this COVID situation and we are trying still to work. And this is what I would say thanks to the communication services that have been enabled us to do it. But also, we have also to, to take into consideration that uh, the technology is rapidly evolving and it's going to go uh, across all industries and all sectors. And we are expecting to have everything everywhere and everyone is going to benefit from the next future uh, wireless communications. Uh, you can see that we have also a vision how, how to look at it and how this is will look. There are a lot of sectors that needs also communication services like a healthcare, education, electricity, and, and these are essential. They have a communication objective, which is essential for them. You, you, you will see how, how, how these are going to evolve. It's started with 5G, uh, this industrial um, application, and it's going to evolve also in the future. Uh, from from the perspective of other organizations, also we have to look at sens uh, sustainability goals, and that needs to be realized. Uh, and this is these goals are uh, ITU, 3GPP, CBT, and Europe are working to realize these goals in in terms of uh, efficiency, um, green, and all of those aspects that have been mentioned by uh, the European Commission in in their presentations. So uh, we have been also, as I have said before, that we have uh, we need to, to connect people. We are connecting currently. 5G is making a tremendous job in connecting people, and this is will going to go everywhere, and is going to expand out in the planet. 
So we are expecting that we are, will have a 10 billion people being connected. We have uh, a thousand billion things is being con uh, being connected as well for the next future. And then we are having to have a seamless coverage. We're going to have uh, everywhere, everything and everywhere. As Alexander Kuhn has mentioned that you will have a network of network and these are the, the goals that we are looking for. We wanted to realize and IMT is a facilitator to help those uh, goals to be realized and be achieved. Second uh, slide, please. So uh, this is what the part is about the usage. It's about the goals and, and, and things to, to achieve. But we also have to, to sit back again and look at what IMT have been doing in, uh, in the past and what it's going to do in the future. And if you look at in a 10 years escape, you say that we have a 5G initial deployment in, uh, I would say, uh, 160 countries. There is an initial deployment, or they are underway, or there's a licensing, and they are rollout, and you can touch the 5G uh, deployment and touch the 5G network. But 5G is also going to have an expansion, and it's going to be expanded from 2025 to a new era. And this is, is going to include also expansion in the spectrum, which is uh, currently under uh, planning in different regions uh, in the time frame from 2023 and plus five years, like, like, like that one. Also, not only the expansion uh, of the 5G, we have a 6G, which has already started the discussion. There is an early research and planning, which is going uh, uh, around in ITU and in different places that is targeting 20, 2030 timeframe for the completion or having at least the first set of the specification of these um, 6G um, standards. Next slide, please. From the research point of view, this is our example. So I'm just presenting you an example around the global for this, uh, the different research who are doing technology research, regulatory research, and they are giving us some ideas how is those usage scenario can be looked at. And uh, you see in Europe, I will, um, I will, I will just mention one one project here is a HexaX, uh, which is one of the projects that uh, one pioneer project in Europe which is trying to look into these digital worlds, uh, the human world and the physical world, and as well um, to look at it from, from a different angle. They have also published several reports and deliverables. You can take a look at them. And this is one of those uh, projects that are contributing to development of the future systems, of course. Uh, around the global, we have Korea, we have China, Japan, and in US, we have the next uh, alliance uh, as one of those building a foundation for the leadership of the 6G research in US. So these are examples what is going on. So the research on, on the 6G had already been started. They are going into an unstable uh, path from which we can see also the initial examples, where are those connectivity and technologies are going to evolve and are going to become. Next slide, please. But not only just the research. Um, uh, we have started in ITU, the discussion, the major elements in these building blocks of the new technology is already in a stable version. There is a technology trends report in ITU our 5D working party, which is about to, which is supposed to be finalized by the mid of this year. So in less than five months time, we will see the first technology trends, where are the trends for the new technology is coming, where are the usage scenarios that are going to be discussed, what what kind of technologies we will have uh, is foreseen for this um, new dimension of, of, of connectivity. Then there is a vision which is uh, in, in, a, in a good shape in its way. There is also some technical visibility studies on those terahertz things. And we are also uh, having an idea from the ITR point of view where, uh, where we are going to end up. And we have this finalization in and around 2030. Next slide, please. So these are the things. But 
what is the spectrum here and where is those uh, thinking about the spectrum they are still um, areas for research and debate and uh, as you see that for example in in 5g we have been looking at certain uh, the millimeter wave and uh, europe had the pioneer bands around the c band and other bands uh, we are also and, and we have the low bands where we will have a 5g um, implementation around it but this is going to be expand in the 6g uh, area and we are going to think about new future spectrum and also a potential WRC agenda item to realize some of those bands around high, mid, and low bands. So we have to think about the spectrum itself, but also, also some technologies that enable a real sharing. And this early discussion had already started around the sharing. Also, we have to also to have a debate about the role of non-triestel network. So to sum it up, maybe the next slide, please. So to sum it up uh, for the new for the landscape of the new connectivity, we are uh, thinking from a GSA point of view that the existing bands can be still used in, in all of the ranges. Also, we have to consider what is going to be the outcome of this upcoming WRC 23 in agenda, uh, in particular agenda item 1.2 and 1.5. The 6G research is in a way we, we see many examples in around the global. Subterra Hertz is, uh, let's say, uh, one of the frontier uh, in the high band research, but this is not only just the spectrum where the 6G should be. We have to think about coverage and as well capacity. It remains also crucial to have as well discussion around all the spectrum ranges that could satisfy and fulfill the vision for 6G. We are planning from a GSA to contribute to the agenda items, to the and support the ongoing discussion in ITU uh, and the vision and the 3GPP standards as well. Next slide, please. So together, let's continue to realize this vision, uh, the IMT 2030 vision and going into uh, and going beyond 5G and continue the success. And we have seen a lot of successful example of 5G and let's go let's continue and take this momentum of successful of 5G to uh, further expand into a new connectivity thank you great thanks so much Ayman to, to for this presentation especially kind of digging a bit more into the topic of, of 6G which of course if you look at the future you need to talk about um, the final speaker in the session is is Lorin Hood Lorin is a government affairs director at Microsoft, and it's going to be very interesting after we had a more of a regulatory and maybe kind of technology view to have more of a service view. So, Lorin, floor is all yours. I look forward to your contribution. Thank you very much, Mark, um, and thank you all uh, for having me here. Um, for Microsoft, connectivity is very important, of course, because it's a foundational layer for the cloud services we offer and also for our customers to be able to digitize and society generally to digitize. So I, I, I like to see us as a sort of privileged observers in, in, in connectivity. We do not, we are a bit further away from, from the operation of Spectrum, yet we have clear views on, um, on connectivity and, and the role of Spectrum uh, in that regard. Now, before looking at the future, I'd maybe just um, like to look at the connectivity landscape today. If we, we, we see that it's already um, diversifying very much, it's becoming um, much more varied than it was before. Um, of course, there is a, a huge role for the traditional telecom and MNOs uh, operators, uh, but even their services with 5G are becoming more hybrid. For, for example, with 5G slicing, or we saw also the move to edge computing, uh, where traditional telco will play a role. But next to traditional uh, MNOs, we see uh, new operators popping up. Think of um, tower companies that be are becoming increasingly customer facing. Think of the 5G private networks that we're seeing rolled out in different industries. Um, and uh, in all of that, we also see a, a larger role for cloud uh, and, and for software generally, I think, whether it's cloud-based or software. Um, that is, for example, what we see in the open RAN uh, ecosystem. So 
I I want I just wanted to take that minute to 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 yeah make us aware that today we are already seeing a very diverse and converging uh, uh, ecosystem and. I just spoke only about 5G, but it's broader than that. It has been mentioned already a couple of times. No one is disputing 5G is not in a, existing in a vacuum. There is fiber. Uh, we've been speaking about uh, the, role, the increasing role of satellites with Simon. Um, and, and, and I just want to uh, double down on, on, on the remarks from, from Meta on Wi-Fi, which we see as a, an important complement to 5G for the in-home, the in-office or the in-factory uh, connectivity. So that's for today. Uh, we think that this, um, let's say, this more diverse ecosystem is logic because each business case is different and um, ideally should have recourse to the ideal mix of te technologies and, and the ideal constellation. We do think um, that this, um, this diversity will, of course, only increase. This trend will not stop. Um, and if we think of um, the 6G um, era, uh, it, it is likely to, be, to become uh, only, only more diverse. Um, with uh, an even greater role for virtualization and also for AI and machine learning, we think, if only to control <laughs> the complexity uh, of, 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 of those uh, future networks. Um, when it comes to spectrum in the future, we think it's very uh, important uh, to embrace this um, holistic approach, uh, technology neutral approach. Um, it's important that regulators think of um, this, the, the need for having a mix of um, technologies and that uh, requires also a more holistic view on spectrum. Uh, we need spectrum for 5G, 6G for sure, but other technologies are important, like Wi-Fi, satellite, fixed wild, uh, wireless access, and, 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 and so forth. So, so that is important, we think. And when it comes to uh, traditionally licensed spectrum, of course, it's important to look at spectrum reallocations and, and, and usage of the higher spectrum bands, for sure. But we do want to insist clearly on the importance of spectrum sharing. Uh, which we think we can increase uh, flexibility and, and efficiency of spectrum users. And this, we think, is especially uh, important in, in rural areas. We as Microsoft have a little contribution in that regard with our uh, activities in the TV for white spaces, which are mainly in Africa and in other uh, parts of the world. Um, but beyond spectrum, um, 6G will require um, a more global approach, we think, even than what is the case today. So global standards will remo remain very, very important, we think, will increase in importance. And standards generally, I think, with an even more diverse ecosystem, standards will, will remain very important for trust, privacy, security, maybe even more so than what is the case today. And finally, I think um, there will probably, I think you will agree that there will be no uh, future connectivity if it doesn't... Um, endorse and embrace the sustainability uh, goals, both sustainable ICT, but also how ICT can help sustainability. Um, so that's for the forward looking uh, uh, view. Um, then just a, a last reflection on how we look at the uh, proposal from the European Com Com Commission on the digital decade path. Um, so that you know, sets forth ambitions and, and goals in digital and in connectivity for 2030. Um, we think these goals are good, desirable, uh, they, they are needed. Um, yet, um, if, if you look at the goals, it's, it's still, a, it looks like a bit of a traditional way of thinking. It's gigabit society, um, gigabit connectivity, 5G. It's still a little bit monolistic, a bit uni, unidimensional. We think especially this, 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 this uh, how shall I say, this diversified ecosystem and the need for a mixture of technologies is not very well reflected today. We think it could help if um, in, the, in, the, in the text proposal one would add a clarification of what is meant by gigabit society and make clear that it's a really technology neutral uh, concept that uh, embraces different technologies. Very concretely, and a bit more short term, uh, we think that uh, the Commission should pave the way 
for uh, opening up the six the entire six gigahertz band for Wi-Fi in coexistence with satellite because we think that that will contribute to this uh, mixture of of technologies that we think is so necessary for uh, a vibrant digital economy. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Berlin, for for this for this uh, for this point of view. I think there were sim certain similarities when it came to the importance of Wi-Fi and the six gigahertz bands between yourselves and Meta, um, which some of the mobile operators may have a slightly different view on. But that's exactly this maybe the sort of introduction to this discussion. Um, thanks again to all of you for, for your co for your contributions. I think you you highlighted a, a number of challenges, um, and I think. In a session like this, where you have to look at the future, you always have to deal with with uncertainty. Um, we've we've mentioned a few of the challenges, but maybe kind of um, my my initial question before we kind of jump into in, into questions from from the audience is um, how you know how do you tr and maybe it's more a question for Brandy and Alexander, but others are welcome to, to join in. How do you try to tackle a situation like this where you you kind of there's probably more certainty on the services than it necessarily is on the on the infrastructure that support that's, that's supposed to support these services. So how do you how do you set up a a regime and maybe not just spectrum but kind of market overall that's sufficiently flexible to allow the market to evolve without kind of without restricting without restricting um, kind of the, kind of without predefining a market structure. And I don't know whether that question is a bit too broad or not, but maybe as a starting point for the discussion, kind of what do we think the future market may look like, or how can we assure that we, we're not too prescriptive on the market and, and stop a kind of evolution? Okay, maybe maybe I could start, Alex, yeah. Um, I think this is a very good question. It's a more forward looking one. Uh, I, have, uh, well, I, I have to stress first that uh, we have, a, of course, a paramount principle in the US spectrum policy, which is technology and service neutrality. I think this is to be observed also for the future. Uh, and uh, our, I see our role in, uh, say, monitoring technological developments and anticipating what spectrum needs we have to meet and uh, how we can ensure the spectrum necessary for, let's say, the next trends like uh, what we heard convergence uh, between uh, plat platforms, more cooperative ways of providing seamless services and coverage. Uh, I think uh, uh, what Alex also referred to as, uh, is uh, um, uh, being in a box system and now moving to a more converged system is very true. And uh, our role is, as regulators is really to anticipate and to to uh, not to and to remove barriers barriers to any sort of cooperation or on any sort of provision of more converged and hybrid uh, services of course this will entail uh, assessment of spectrum needs it will entail a process also at the EU level which i think uh, where i think we can uh, look back at a positive experience made with 5g the 5g spectrum roadmap the uh, extensive stakeholder consultations we we did in the preparation of the 5g action plan and based on this uh, assessment of uh, broad stakeholder input uh, we should move on with uh, uh, let's say uh, defining uh, uh, the the next uh, levels of our spectrum roadmap beyond 5g yeah Alexander, i don't know if you want to add anything uh, it's tr tricky tricky to, to to add something running me touched already uh, on, on a lot of uh, issues which i would say as well but technology neutrality is definitely one of the, the key points here as, as well as service neutrality it should not be seen that my comments should intervene that we would like to concentrate just on one technology but it needs to be observed in any case that there is an interest uh, on all sides to um, cooperate and this needs to be incentive there should be further incentives in moving into that direction if this is moving into some some kind of convergence on a technology basis of course this is possible but this should not be um already uh, set as a prerequisite by the regulators this is not our intention uh, and standardization plays an important role in that in that regard however this interest in order to get on mobile devices and make mobile devices more smart or more enhanced in order to allow more services and that allow also ubiquitous connectivity 
that is, I think, one key point which should be taken away from all of the presentations today. Uh, and, and how to do this, this is then, then the question. This goes along from my understanding of, of the spectrum regulation so far with an enhanced sharing opportunity. So um, we, we had already the, the clear indication that we would like to move away from exclusive spectrum usage. We would like to allow sharing. And if this cooperative approach is then moved towards the direction of more sharing equipment, we make you more efficient use of the spectrum, and this would allow also more better bandwidth and better connectivity throughout the whole landscape in Europe and throughout the world. And that's that's something which needs to be incentivized as well. And I'm, I'm happy that we, we would like to touch base on further ideas in that direction. Um, as I said, this may require uh, further discussions, of course, on the industry side and all of the stakeholders in order to see how we can ensure in that kind of environment also then the security and also the predictability of regulatory decisions. Um, we would like to have also that we have a clear spectrum planning. We would like to make spectrum available in a certain case. That's everything said, and that's, of course, important in order to allow the innovative discussions and the investments into the networks of the future. However, in order to really bring then something to the consumer, we need to make it more available and we can't uh, yeah, reinvent more spectrum in that direction. And we, we I think if I look to the question so far, uh, we see that we, we need to reform spectrum. So take away from one and put it to the other. It's maybe one option, but may, how, to, how to make more and efficient use of the spectrum is the really important question for the next decade. Thank you. Yes. Um, actually, you're kind of you're really touching on my kind of uh, was trying to your into my next question, which is um, the obvious question to ask any sort of conference is this: um, what other bands are around? We know the six gigahertz band is is, is an important band, and Lorlene, you've touched on it, and kind of, I think kind of the, the the answers here kind of highlight the issue you have with a band like the six gigahertz. Do you give it all the kind of do you make the full 1.2 gigahertz available for Wi-Fi? Do you kind of split it between, let's say, a more traditional exclusive approach and uh, and, uh, and and then only giving half the the, the, the capacity to to, to Wi-Fi? Um, and and it kind of illustrates, with, uh, I guess, the, the 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 problem you're facing, where decision today may very well influence the direction the, the future is going. Um, so maybe kind of just to kind of go on with with one other regulatory question. Um, are there any plans to consider other bands for 6G and maybe kind of below the terahertz range at the starting point? Are you, are you kind of aware of any any other bands kind of maybe below millimeter wave, below below terahertz that could be used for 6G in the future? Either Branimir or Alex, I don't know if you have any. Okay, maybe I'll start maybe first. This, way, this time the other way around, too. <laughs> <laughs> this time the other way around. Um, yeah, we, 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 we made already um, a, a huge assumption uh, within the range, uh, I would say, 6 to 24 before, um, and, and now 7 to 24. It's, it's rather difficult in order to find uh, the right bandwidth there available, which allows then also um, huge new networks uh, on, a, on a larger scale. Um, if, if we talk about, um, yeah, I would say localized usages, then maybe there are, there are possibilities, but on a broader scale, it would be very tricky um, in the range of 7 to 24 to find really uh, the, the right amount of bandwidth, which is essential then for the, for the next, uh, upcoming networks and even for 5G. Yes, I can, I can, I can share the view that uh, uh, there is a certain difficulty in finding additional spectrum between 7 and 24 gigahertz. Um, we, as I mentioned in my presentation, we very much look up, uh, look at the take up of millimeter waves. Uh, we have already one harmonized band. We're moving toward, towards the harmonization of another one. We have the 60 gigahertz range, uh, which offers plenty of bandwidth for more advanced applications. This is regarding the higher frequency ranges. Uh, in the in the mid band, uh, uh, low band, obviously we have this uh, discussion regarding the six gigahertz band, uh, and uh, of course we're committed uh, to to a, an European approach for the next WRC. Um, I, I have heard also the different views regarding the potential use of this band. I can stress regarding this and possibly other bands in the future, in particular in the mid band range, that uh, of course shared use spectrum sharing will be a priority and at least in in whatever tasks uh, the commission could give to the cpt in agreement with the member states regarding 
um, also potential harmonization of, of new of new spectrum uh, ranges. And then maybe kind of kind of moving on from this and maybe involving the uh, kind of moving a bit towards <laughs> the, the 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 operator involving the other panel members as well. And maybe maybe Simon or Ayman. One question I would have, and kind of picking up from another question that was asked by the audience. Um, some people are a bit cynical and say, look, you know, we've, we've discussed millimeter wave for, for, for a whole number of years and nothing has happened, nothing much has happened yet. Um, now we're talking terahertz. Is that all a distraction? And should we maybe kind of um, focus our, our efforts on, on, on some other areas? Or do you kind of, from, a, from an infrastructure level, do you, do you see a, a role for terahertz either in the satellite or a, or a mobile um, world? Um, so terahertz per se is not is not something that satellites are likely to use from Earth to ground. But if, if we talk about using um, complex constellations, maybe it will form part of the inter-satellite links. Um, it, but there's a, I suspect that will probably be optical. So um, from a satellite perspective, I don't think there's a huge in, impact. I think that the graph that... Uh, Emman presented with the um, distance versus speed. Satellite is probably more to the, to, you know, pro providing resilience and content prepositioning towards the middle of that curve and extending the reach and and the, and the reliability to the to the bottom left. Having said that, I think one or two of the applications that might use this capacity will will have significant amounts of content that need to be positioned at the edge. Satellite is very good at sending the same content to many locations simultaneously. So there may be a, 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 a support complementary role there for satellites. Beyond that, I, I struggle. So, okay, uh, thank you for this question. It's a good and, and a nice question. I just wanted to take you a little bit back uh, to Europe. I don't recall when exactly in Europe we have a 5G roadmap. We had a very good roadmap and we have started with uh, po uh, painting a picture with taking the 3.6 at the one of the pioneer band and one millimeter wave as one also was uh, the 26 gigahertz as one of those pioneer bands to to be taken into consideration for the realization of the 5g i, I don't recall the time and I think uh, uh, from that point of view is that uh, when we are working towards the future, terahertz as one frontier is now under research for the mobile communication. And, it's a, and uh, we are studying it. For example, I said that there is a, a study in ITUR on the visibility of using those higher frequencies for future wireless system. So we think that this is one of the areas of the spectrum that also could contribute to the success for 6G. But also, we don't have to forget other frequencies and other spectrums. And um, like we have also to think about where, where to do it. So I have a comp I have painted a picture which is saying that 6G is not only about capacity, but there should be capacity coverage and other aspects and a network of networks as been described by Alexander Kuhn. So, so to, to, to make it, it's, you can't, you can't pin at this point of time a certain kind of frequency range. All of them need to be studied, explored and, and, and used. But uh, definitely sub terahertz is one of the frontier that is also should be taken into consideration. Thank you. No, I don't know if you if if you, if you want to have anything more to add on this. Um, otherwise, I would um, move on to the to the to another question, which I thought is very very interesting thought, um, <clears throat> which is that and maybe I'll start with you, Lauren, on this one. We've talked a lot about kind of quality of service. Meta outlined nicely the various kind of requirements on latency, etc. <clears throat> At the same time, we talk a lot about maybe kind of sharing spectrum, unlicensed use and kind of a more flexible arrangement towards handing out or licensing frequencies. Now, how do you kind of combine the, the dichotomy of, of strict service requirements and, <clears throat> sorry, unlicensed, unlicensed and possibly, but let's say, wilder use? Is that is that something that can be solved? Um, or kind of what do you think could, could, could help kind of solve that issue? 
Well, I think it will depend very much on the specificities of the business case. First of all, is it out or in? Uh, what What is the stability of service required? Uh, what is the... Um, um, the, the latency required, of course, <laughs> the costs <laughs> maybe also. But anyhow, I mean, I think in terms of technical specificities, um, I the name um, escapes me recently, but uh, in Belgium you have this uh, B2B uh, mobile operator, um, which, 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 which actually is, is um, very active in, in having, uh, supporting, uh, like, for example, the, the, the seashore um, the seashore uh, windmill parks and with, 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 with networks and so on. And I know that they use, um, they use obviously 5G connectivity, but they use also Wi-Fi as a backup or as, a, as, as an extension. Uh, there are so many different use cases and you cannot just, I believe, um, find a one size fits all. And, and, and it's not always the same requirements that apply, apply in all situations. I don't know if the veteran has one kind of burning me or do you want to add any, anything else on this? Um, yeah, maybe just a few words. Uh, I think we are, we are committed uh, in terms of spectrum policy regulation uh, to ensure the necessary conditions for a high quality uh, service, high quality coverage, uh, high capacity, whatever this may mean, depending on the particular service. And uh, as we will have a spectrum mix, I, I believe also in the future, we'll have a, a mix of uh, um, appropriate authorization approaches, be it uh, less exempt or shared or, or even exclusive. And uh, this will be determined to a large uh, extent by the need to uh, ensure for market players the necessary quality of service, which of course entails uh, further uh, social and economic uh, benefits. So, uh, so we are open in that regard, and of course, uh, we should have a very flexible approach. But uh, of course, under the paradigm of ensuring efficient spectrum use. Yeah, maybe maybe one point, Mark, uh, on, on that one as well. Well, um, if if you say always license unlicensed uh, spectrum does not allow any quality of service, I, I think Wi-Fi is a good example that it provides already some kind of stable quality of service in all of our homes today, uh, and and this spectrum is in 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 that terms unlicensed or uh, in my regulatory terms generally authorized. Um, however, if we if we now speak about the future, what to do is then the question how we can ensure this certainty, which Ronnie may just mentioned, uh, also in a more user, in an environment with more users. That might require more monitoring, either on a on a private side or uh, even on the public side. So we we need to be be careful and uh, think about also ways there in order to ensure how the regulation will be um, used. Because many of the problems of the unlicensed use is that the user is moving beyond this the license the license requirements which ensuring the efficient use of the of the spectrum and, and this is something which needs to be uh, kept in mind as well how we can make better afford in, in that direction as well but this may require then also further discussions which are not very consumer friendly to a certain degree and and, and this is something which uh, at least the regulator have to take into account as well yeah yeah i was, I was thinking that kind of if you talk about well you don't have necessarily unlicensed use but even if you move away from kind of exclusive nationwide licenses to maybe kind of regional licenses, for example, which kind of, I know the Buenos Aires Agentur has done for 26 gigahertz and for part of the 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, you know, I guess propagation is, is an advantage because, you know, it's easier to to um, to manage networks if the reach of, of a band isn't particularly far, but there's kind of a step beyond that, you know, you have to, if, if somebody relies on, on those bands for their, let's say for their, in, for their, for their manufacturing, there can't be interference from somebody else just because they don't know how to use how to use those things and then our device available. Yeah. Simon, please. Yeah, so um, I, I can't sort of talk to the pure spectrum side as much as I'm my, my esteemed colleagues on the panel. But one point I keep hearing from from Laurie and the others is that um, we're not talking you're talking about multiple different solutions to provide the same service in different locations to different people. And that for me implies that probably one of the most important areas to think about is how, how, do, how do applications ask for a particular kind of class of service? How, how are they trusted? How does the network trust that, that, that that application is entitled to that and someone will pay for that level of service, be it through um, 
public Wi-Fi, private Wi-Fi, satellite, 6G, 5G, 5G advanced, whatever. It's it's building those the control processes, the control protocols, the trust the trust models, the billing models, and so forth to make all that work. I think is going to be the glue that stitches all this together. Yeah. I think that's a very 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 good point, and it kind of it, it moves back to the to the network of the kind of. If you, if you have a let's say a, di a more diverse network ecosystem than you have today, which is typically your mobile network and then your kind of some sort of fixed network as you move out. If I guess a lot of the views we've been we've been told about today have a more hybrid view where the devices may switch more frequently between networks and there may be a range of providers. Now, the question whether that materializes, but at least that's kind of the that, that's that sort of view on this. You, you absolutely you need to make sure that kind of in this process, um, a the user is protected, but also kind of the, the, the service is kind of is protected, but also kind of others are protected. So it's getting a it's quite a complex arrangement to make sure that if, if you talk about it's, it's easy to talk about those sort of worlds, but it's a I guess it's a whole other headache to uh, to actually get it to, to, to work without uh, without causing issues. Lots of regulations and lots of standards and lots of work leading to that, I suspect. Yeah. Maybe a question to to Ayman in that regard, um, would, would you agree that the mobile user equipment uh, is then on the path to be the new network uh, <laughs> path <laughs> in, a, in a meshed environment? Be, be, because I, I think I saw on the, uh, on the questions also the thing between Wi-Fi, uh, ubiquitous connectivity, and, and also 5G. So we, 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 we have then the convergence already in our mobile phones, at least on those technologies. And I, I think that on other networks, this, this is moving into a similar direction. So our, our mobile computing will be then the, the, the new way forward, but that will create a lot of new challenges on the development of those user equipment, isn't it? Uh, I wouldn't call them challenges, but I would call them opportunities. These are opportunities for innovation, and uh, we we have to uh, a little bit move away from uh, traditional devices and think about how to evolve into the devices systems. But uh, but I don't want to speak uh, on, on that things. But I think I think if um, if we look at uh, what is currently in the research and uh, what is currently, for example, developed under the I in the under the flagship of ITU. For example, if somebody talk about this evolving of trends and technology, they are also touching upon what kind of uh, devices, the trends of the, the new devices, what kind of devices, they are going to be wearable devices, they are going to be, uh, there are a lot of certain kind of devices to be used. So there is a, a movement into, let's say, I wouldn't say force uh, dimension, but there is a movement somehow and, um, uh, this this triangle which we have experienced in, uh, in in 5G is going to remain still for 6G, but it's going to be in another dimension. So what we will have today is maybe not applicable for 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 the areas of, of that one, but we will have a different devices, different sort of devices, wearable design de devices, sensing and everything. So it's it's difficult. It's opportunities. It's not challenges, it's opportunities for evolvement and, and innovation. And it's uh, we're going to see more, more out of it. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and we've kind of pretty much reached the end of the panel. I know there were more and more detailed questions, but hopefully with slightly a slightly broader discussion, we've, we've been able to, to address some of them. Um, I think in particular, what, what at least what I've taken away from the session, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, identifying new spectrum bands below millimeter wave is going to be difficult. Um, there has to be a careful balance has to be struck between between kind of enabling new use cases without stifling um, the existing networks. Um, and I think also there was a question about kind of possibly kind of infringing on other services for the for the sake of, of another G. And my feeling is from the discussion fair today there is a there's an awareness that you have to be careful about about just broadly allocating allocated spectrum groups a particular service, but you have to kind of take a much wider view in terms of enabling a possibly more converged future with a lot of challenges on maybe even on the device side. And of course, as we all know, on the network side. 
Um, I hope I hope that 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 that, that covers um, some of the discussion we've had. I, I want to thank you all again for for your contributions. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. Future discussions are always difficult because they're a little bit a little bit more abstract than than maybe a a, a battle about what to do with the UHF band or the six gigahertz band right now. Um, but I think as as Alexander, as you quite nicely said, they they need to be thought about today to make sure we're not stuck in ten years in a situation that we kind of could have moved it out if we thought a bit more about it. So thanks everyone again um, for, mm -hmm. for a great session. I hope it was interesting to the um, to the to the audience as well. Um, and uh, with this, I will hand back to Dan. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, from from my side as well to uh, to all of our panelists for uh, a fascinating discussion. And Mark, uh, to you as well for, uh, for for moderating that so so well as well. So thank you all so much. And of course, I should say to to Guillaume and Bruno remotely for joining for the earlier presentations. But really interesting discussion, and uh, I'm sure somewhere there's going to be lots more to uh, to, to follow on. So um, so really interesting. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. So um, we're now going to uh, be moving on to uh, another break. So we have now a uh, lunch break. Um, let me bring up the proceedings. Here we go. So we now have a, a brief lunch break, and then we're back with the last two sessions of the day. So starting at 2.05, um, we have a session looking at uh, delivering digital equality and looking at um, what can be done to meet the targets of 5G connectivity for all by 2030. And then uh, between 3.40 and 4.35, we have our last panel of the day, last panel of the conference, I should say, uh, which is going to be looking at densification and delivering densification um, and looking at kind of rollout of 5G networks in, in urban areas. And then following that, we're going to be wrapping everything up and bringing everything together with our final conclusion session. Um, so we're going to be hearing from some of the speakers on their key thoughts, their key takeaways uh, from the event, your chance as well to give us your final thoughts. And as ever, um, uh, we have the, the live music to finish us off from the Sweet Beats. So uh, something not to be missed there. So that's all still to come. Um, in the meantime, uh, do uh, enjoy, enjoy your lunch. And uh, don't forget as well that you do have the option of now going to see the uh, on-demand sessions, uh, the showcase sessions in the on-demand area, which are available for you to watch uh, at your convenience there as well. Thanks all so much. And we'll see you back here in uh, just about 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes for the next session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Egon Schulz from Huawei Munich Research Center in Germany. 6G is a common vision of our ICT industry future. 6G will the future platform for everything we do in our daily life and work. 6G is global. We are excited that we will have the opportunity to participate shaping 6G with our friends and partners in the European research community. Europe will play a leadership role to create 6G. Thank you for your attention. My name is Filippo Gianti from Qualcomm. 2022 is the year of 5G millimeter wave in Europe. Decisions will be made by key countries, key operators, and key device vendors to roll out this technology. Using both 5G millimeter wave and midband, operators can offer the multi gigabit speeds and the massive capacity required in what is a video first, uplink driven, post pandemic world. I will show you how operators can increase up to 8% their annual revenue by rolling out 5G millimeter wave in these high density everyday locations, while saving up to 75% of their costs. Join me for this exciting showcase in the on-demand area. Hi, my name is Marta Suarez. I am the president of the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, and I'm very excited to participate in this event and also to invite you to our showcase entitled Ensuring Wi-Fi Connectivity in a Digitally Connected Gigabit European Society. That showcase session, we are going to cover the last updates 
and uh, we're going to talk about that technology that's omnipresent in our lives, that is Wi-Fi, and why it is so important and crucial for the next decade goals in terms of connectivity. So don't miss our session. Uh, you can find it on the on-demand area of the event platform. Thank you. Hello, my name is Calvin Bahia, and I'm a principal economist at GSMA Intelligence. I have the pleasure to invite you to watch our showcase where my colleague Caroline Butler will present the findings of our new study that explains how policymakers can carry out a socio-economic cost-benefit analysis for different authorization models for the 6 GHz frequency band. This includes both licensed and unlicensed options. It also presents the results of applying such an analysis for 12 countries. You can find the showcase on the on-demand area of the platform, and we hope you find it useful and interesting. Thank you very much.